today on Grace To You. The Christian view of history says God created us with a purpose in mind. And history is His story. And He pre-wrote it in eternity past, and now it's playing out in precise accordance with His will and purpose. The next time He comes, He doesn't come in humility. He comes in glory. He doesn't come to rescue. He comes to condemn. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We live in an increasingly secular world. We have probably more atheists now than any time in the history of our nation. Seems to be a global phenomenon that genuine Christianity and confidence in what the Bible says is uh, diminishing, not in the sense of the true church, but in the sense of cultural acceptance of what Scripture teaches. As the culture we live in gets more and more secular, it moves further and further away from the Bible, and consequently it moves further and further into emptiness. Philosophers and historians have always struggled with the ultimate question, and the ultimate question is simply this, why are we here? Where are we going? What's the purpose of history? What's the purpose of human existence? What is the meaning of life? And even though we've made scientific and technological advances, we don't seem to have made advances in terms of morality or being able to sustain relationships meaningfully. Where is human life headed? Is it headed anywhere? Is there any point? Is there any purpose? Is there any end to this succession of events apparently leading nowhere? Does life have a goal, or are we just protoplasm waiting to become manure, just a long evolutionary joke? There's a cry for understanding. There's a cry for an answer to this existential question of what does it all mean and is there an end to this? But there doesn't seem to be an answer. Certainly for the secularists, there is no answer at all. There are three possible views of history that are offered, if you just kind of reduce them all to the simplest form. The first would be that history is cyclical, that basically it just goes around in a circle chasing its own tail. It uh, doesn't move forward in any linear sense, it just cycles and spirals back through the same things. No advance. We're not going anywhere. We're achieving nothing. We're contributing to nothing. We mean nothing. We have no significance. That doesn't work for some people. And so a second option is um, naturalism. Naturalism would say that History really is linear, and human life is linear. It's not going around in endless circles. It's actually moving in some direction. It is not repetitive, but it still doesn't really identify any meaning to it because naturalism is, by definition, atheistic. That's why it's called naturalism instead of supernaturalism. So this is just another view that says we aren't going in circles, we're going in a straight line, but the straight line is going nowhere. There's no end to the straight line, there's no purpose, there's no goal, everything is meaningless. This perspective was articulated by Bertrand Russell, the celebrated British philosopher, who said, there is no law of cosmic progress. From evolution, there is no ultimately optimistic philosophy that can be validly inferred. There's no way to know why we're here, where we're going, 
where we're going to end up. We're just going forward into nothingness. That's not a very satisfying view, even as the first view is not satisfying. But there's a third one, and that's the biblical view. The Christian view of history stands in utter opposition to those two views. The Christian view of history says God created us with a purpose in mind, and history is His story. And He pre-wrote it in eternity past, and now it's playing out in precise accordance with His will and purpose. And it has a direction. It had a very clear beginning as revealed in the book of Genesis, and it has a very clear ending as revealed throughout the Scripture and culminating in the book of Revelation. We are significant. We are going somewhere. And that somewhere has been identified definitely by God. And in this movement through time that we call human history, there is a central figure. And that central figure is the Lord Jesus Christ. His first coming was in humility so that He might die for the sins of His people and rise again to give them eternal life. After His first coming, He ascended back into heaven and promised to return. The next time He comes, He doesn't come in humility. He comes in glory. He doesn't come to die. He comes to reign. He doesn't come to rescue. He comes to condemn. The second coming of Christ is where history is headed. It is moving rapidly to that end. That end has been eternally designed by God with absolute detail, much of which is written on the pages of Scripture. We don't need to be in the dark about the purpose of mankind or the meaning of history if we just read the Word of God, the Holy Scripture. But to sum it up and simplify it, history is headed toward what the Bible calls the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. That is a technical term used in Scripture to define the final judgment, the final judgment. It is called the day of the Lord because it is the end of man's day, man's day. We're living in man's day. Obviously, we are under the power of Satan and his demons, but still, we operate with a measure of freedom in this world to create our own environment. This is man's day. Man is in charge. Man is in charge essentially at every level. This is the kingdom of man within the kingdom of darkness, which is under the ruler Satan. This is man's day. You can look at history and see what man has made of it. But what is coming is the Lord's day. It will be a day of cataclysmic judgment. That judgment will fall on all who have not repented of their sins and embraced Jesus as Lord and Savior. What you do with Jesus Christ is the determiner of your eternal destiny. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and this is the epistle of Paul that we're looking at, he introduces to us in the opening three verses this term, the day of the Lord. Let me read those verses to you. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. There in verse 2, we are introduced to the day of the Lord. That's where history's going. 
The day of the Lord is not a popular theme for preachers. It should be, but it isn't. Preachers want to make people feel good. They want to affirm people. They want people to believe that they are loved, even by God. They want to bring comfort. So it's not popular to preach on wrath or vengeance or judgment or condemnation or hell, but it is essential. The day of the Lord is coming and obviously is nearer than it has ever been. Now Paul was faithful to preach the day of the Lord. In preaching the gospel to them, he told them about the wrath to come, eternal wrath, the day of the Lord, and subsequently following the day of the Lord, eternal punishment in the lake of fire. He told them that so that they were waiting for His Son from heaven who would come to rescue them from the wrath to come. You could say they were waiting, waiting for the snatching away and they were waiting to be rescued from God's final day of the Lord, wrath. This was essential to His ministry of preaching the gospel to warn people about the wrath to come. Chapter 5, where we are, look at verse 9, God has not destined us for wrath but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the gospel comes to those who are told about the coming wrath and want to know how to escape it. So he was a faithful pastor. Even with a brief time in Thessalonica, he made sure they understood that salvation saved them from not just a lack of purpose in their life but eternal wrath. Believers will be snatched out. The Lord is going to meet us in the air. The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the snatching of the church. Those that are dead, their bodies will come out of the grave first if they're believers, and those that are alive will be caught together with them and taken to heaven. We meet the Lord in the air. This is not the Lord coming to earth to judge. This is not the Lord coming to earth to set up His kingdom. There's no judgment in that event. That event is mentioned in John 14 and 1 Corinthians 15 and this passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, no judgment. We will be snatched and kept from the hour of wrath, the hour of judgment. That is the next event. And Paul wanted to tell these Thessalonian believers that they would be rescued from that, whether they were dead or alive, they would be taken up in that rapture so that verse 18 says He could comfort them because some of them were sad thinking that the believers who died would miss that event and the Lord told them through Paul, no, the dead will rise first in their glorified bodies and the rest of us will be joined to the Lord in the air and will go to heaven to be with Him in the place that He is preparing for us now. That is the snatching of believers all believers across the face of the globe. There's no sign for that event. There's no timing for that event. There are no preliminary events. It's what we call imminent. It could happen at any time. And believers since New Testament times have been living in anticipation of that event. You say that's 2,000 years. Yes, but that's on a human side. In God's kingdom, a day is as a thousand years, Peter says, and a thousand years as a day. And why is God waiting? You say He's waiting until all the elect redeemed have come to faith. So we saw that the believers will be taken out. Then what happens? What about all the unbelievers that are left in the world? We pick that up in chapter 5, verse 1. Now as to, that's a transitional phrase. He is using it quite frequently in his writings to show that we're moving to a new subject. Now we're going from the rapture or snatching of the church to the day of the Lord. We've gone from the comfort that comes to believers to the discomfort that ought to come to non-believers who are faced with this reality. This is the final wrath. This is where history is going. The Lord began human history when He created Adam and Eve. He's in control of it. It has a terminus point. 
Right now it's in the control of man. This is man's day as he functions within the kingdom of darkness led by Satan. But soon will come the end of man's day and the beginning of the Lord's day, the day of the Lord. Now in the passage we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 11 over the next few weeks, there are three features that Paul wants us to understand. The Lord's day, its coming, its character, and its completeness. For now we'll just talk about its coming, okay? That's obvious. In this day of the Lord that is coming, there will be a beginning point which is the snatching away of the church the rapture of the church. There will be the time of tribulation that comes on the earth. There will be the time of great tribulation, which is the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. There will be the rise of Antichrist and the false prophet described in the book of Revelation. There will be the salvation of Israel, also described in the book of Revelation. There will be seal judgments that begin to be broken in uh, Revelation chapter 6, and out of the seventh seal will come seven trumpet judgments. Out of the seventh trumpet judgment will come seven bold judgments. And all of these judgments are described, and they are epics, they are aspects, they are features of the second coming times. There also will be the return of Christ. And when Christ comes back, there will be the battle of Armageddon, a bloodbath that will take place centered in the country of Israel. There will be the sheep and the goats judgment described by our Lord. There will be the binding of Satan and demons for the duration of the millennial kingdom. There will be the release of them at the end to gather a final rebellion. There will be destruction of that rebellion. There will be the great white throne after the millennial kingdom. There will be the final dispatch of Satan and his angels and all unbelievers to the lake of fire. And then there will be the complete destruction of our entire universe followed by the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. All of those are the epics inside the times that make up the day of the Lord, the return of Christ. The question that comes to our minds always, and it came to the disciples' minds, is when is this going to happen? How long do we have to wait? The disciples who were sitting with Jesus looking at the city of Jerusalem before His crucifixion, sitting looking from the Mount of Olives to the Temple Mount, heard Jesus say, this is going to be destroyed. This whole thing is coming down. Not one rock will be left on another. And in response to that, the disciples came to Him privately and said, tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of Your coming? and the end of the age. They always wanted to know when, 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 when. What do we look for? In Acts again, chapter 1, they said in verse 6, Lord, is it at this time You are restoring the kingdom to Israel? We get very preoccupied with time. When is it going to happen? But Paul says in verse 1, you have no need of anything to be written to you. You don't need to know that. You don't need to know that. We just need to know it's coming. We don't need to know when it's coming. Every generation needs to live in the light of the reality that it could come at any time. We should live in expectancy and anticipation. We should be warning people all the time of what is coming. So let's talk about the first point, it's coming. It's coming. Verse 2, you yourselves know full well. Acrobos, good word, means perfectly, completely, accurately, exactly, precisely. Again, this is an indication that Paul had taught them about the wrath to come. Even though he was with them only a few months and they were Gentiles, he made sure that He told them why they needed salvation. And it wasn't just to fix up their life, it was to rescue them from the wrath to come. And He reminds them and us that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. He warned them and He said, 
Thief doesn't announce his arrival. Thief doesn't give you warning, I'll be there between two and three in the morning. Make sure you unlock the door, open the safe, put the jewelry on the floor. The thief does not announce his arrival. The point of all of this and keeping this from us is so that every generation would live in the light of the possibility of that reality in their own time. Now, let me give it to you again simply. The next event on God's clock is the snatching away of believers. After that, all the believers are gone, all that are left on the earth are unbelievers. And then the day of the Lord begins to break out, described in general terms in Matthew 24, also in Luke's parallel passage, and described in detail in Revelation 6 to 18. And that's the day of the Lord breaking out on earth. Now we want to understand something of the character of this day of the Lord. So let's look at it. The day of the Lord appears four times in the Old Testament. I'm sorry, let me say that again. The day of the Lord appears four times in the, in the New Testament. Acts 2.20 in this passage, 2 Thessalonians 2.2 and 2 Peter 3.10, which I referred to a moment ago. But it appears 19 times in the Old Testament. That's its greatest usage. And whenever a Bible writer, New or Old Testament, speaks of the day of the Lord, it's always the same, always the same. So listen to what Scripture says about the day of the Lord. Isaiah 2.12, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it will be brought low. Isaiah 13.6, wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Isaiah 13.9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. Jeremiah 46.10, for this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance that He may avenge Himself on His adversaries. Joel 1.15, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Joel 2.11, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Amos 5.18, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, for what good is the day of the Lord to you? Amos 5.20, is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Malachi 4.5, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Zephaniah 1.14, the great day of the Lord is near, it is near and hastens quickly, the noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. And Zephaniah 1.15, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Six times the day of the Lord is referred to as the day of doom, three times it is referred to as the day of vengeance. Revelation 6, 17 calls it the great day of His wrath, always refers to cataclysmic judgments by God on sinners. It is the culmination of God's fury and wrath. It is climactic. Now God's wrath operates in life all the time through natural expressions. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. You live a certain kind of life, you reap a certain wrath. There is cataclysmic wrath in the world today uh, brought about by natural phenomenon like earthquakes and fires and tsunamis and floods and those kinds of things that catapult people into eternity. There is the wrath of God in Romans 1 where people choose to reject God and He gives them over to immoralities, homosexuality, a reprobate mind. That is the wrath of God released on a culture. But those elements of God's wrath come generally through natural means. Day of the Lord wrath in its ultimate form is supernatural. It is supernatural. The New Testament calls it, Luke 17, 24, His day. It is called the day of wrath, the day of wrath and revelation in uh, Romans 2, 5, the great day of God Almighty. 
Revelation 16, 14. 1 Peter 2, 12, a day of visitation when God visits in judgment. Always a time of the fury of God released on those who reject His Son. Now it is to be distinguished, and you have to mark this, it is to be distinguished from other New Testament days, the day of Christ. There is the day of Christ in Philippians, there is the day of the Lord Jesus in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and there's the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.8. That's different. The day of Christ in any of those forms always has to do with believers meeting Christ. So when we're snatched out of this earth and taken to heaven, that's the day of Christ, when we're with Him and He rewards us and gives us our eternal inheritance. The day of Christ always looks at the believer before His Lord, at the Bema where we receive the reward for what we've done for Him. So before the day of the Lord, there's the day of Christ for believers. After the day of the Lord, there's one other phrase, and it's the day of God, the day of God, 2 Peter 3.12, and it's referring to eternity. After God creates the new heaven and the new earth, it is the final and forever day of God. He reigns and rules. So the day of Christ for believers, the day of God, when God rules in eternity, and in between all the judgments fall under the day of the Lord. Always, always something to fear. For centuries, many have believed they were living during a time of Christ's return. That doesn't surprise us. We read in 2 Peter that the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Matthew tells us that only the Father knows the day or the hour. The only thing we know for sure is with each day that passes, we are one day closer to that glorious hour. With all that fills our days, there can be nothing more important than living our lives with eternity in view. As a Christian, anticipating that hour is anything but dreadful. It's a cause for much anticipation and joy. In his book, Because the Time is Near, Pastor John takes us through the promised blessings described in Revelation. This book is essential to every Christian's devotional life and to furthering your understanding of the hope to come that is revealed in Scripture. Order a copy of Because the Time is Near by visiting our website, gty.org, or by reaching out to our operators by calling 888-57-GRACE. That's 888-57-GRACE. Next week on Grace to You. Whenever you read about the day of the Lord, it is talking about divine judgment. We're now living in man's day. In a sense, we're living in Satan's day. This is when all of that is ended, and it's the Lord's day. The final wrath of God unleashed on all unbelieving sinners. But we don't need to know the time. If we know He could come at any moment, it's likely that we will keep ourselves ready. 